my name is Loris De Giovanni. I'm the founder and CEO of Sysdig. Sysdig does uh, container and microservice uh, monitoring and visibility. Uh, we have products uh, that uh, can be used for uh, visualize, monitor, troubleshoot uh, containers and container-based infrastructures and applications. In particular, today we're going to talk about uh, Docker Swarm monitoring. Um, let's talk a bit about uh, where we're going and why uh, we have a need for uh, special tools to monitor something like Docker Swarm. So, you know, we started uh, uh, 15 years ago with uh, PCs and physical servers, then we moved uh, to virtual machines, and now we are in the middle of the transi transition to containers. And what's interesting about these three phases is uh, not only, let's say, the fundamental piece that you use, yeah, uh, containers are mo more lightweight and easier to orchestrate, but uh, uh, just the philosophy, how the philosophy changes and evolves. We started with the uh, servers where the unit uh, was the machine, there was essentially an orchestrator, uh, our applications were monolithic, and uh, the architecture was, you know, purely uh, server-centric and monolithic. With uh, uh, virtual machines, uh, we went uh, uh, into um, the uh, uh, machine. Uh, I have the slide uh, uh, resorted, but the machine is, uh, is still the unit because uh, it's virtual, but it's still a machine. The orchestration is uh, external, it's bolting on, for example, AWS, and the architecture is still monolithic. With container, we shift because the unit is uh, the application and the service and not the machine anymore. The container is disposable. It's a small unit that doesn't contain a full operating system. It contains only the pieces that are strictly required to run your application. And like in the case of Docker Swarm, the, or the orchestrator is bolted in, so it's native. It's not something that is separate from uh, the unit uh, per se. So we go from something like this, uh, which is uh, my very artistic depiction of a three-tier monolithic infrastructure with cache, with web server, and database, to something like this, right? Where you have services, and you have computing nodes, and uh, services running containers, and are arbitrarily allocated to different computing nodes, and uh, talk to each other in arbitrary ways and can move, you know, at any point in time from machine to machine because the orchestrator does its job and puts the containers where it's best for the performance essentially of the application. So this is great. This is why we are here. Uh, this is powerful. This is changing our life as uh, developers and uh, as operation people. We just want to make sure that this doesn't become like this. Uh, because at least graphically there is a bit of similarity. So uh, there are a couple of things that are harder uh, in this scenario. Uh, the first one is getting the data out of the containers and uh, the second one is making sense of the data. Let's start from getting the data. So what uh, makes container, containers great? The fact that they are simple, small, isolated, they don't have dependencies, also tend tends to make containers more opaque. Uh, we don't uh, have uh, all of uh, the uh, tools that uh, we used to have typically inside the container. Uh, we have less dependencies and uh, uh, it's just not as easy to observe them maybe by putting an agent inside of them like we used to do with physical servers or with virtual machines. So it's a bit like, you know, being, uh, you know, having your container ship and your orchestrator with all of the, of, of the containers on top of that and uh, wanting to avoid to be this guy, right? Uh, so uh, maybe if you have a good beer, it doesn't matter, but in, in, in a general way, ex a purely external visibility limits uh, what uh, uh, you're able to, to observe. So the way we solve this problem at SysDig is uh, uh, by uh, leveraging instrumentation at the operating system level. So here, this is, you know, again, a very simplified diagram in which I have the operating system, and then I have a couple of native applications running just on top of that operating system, and then maybe I have uh, three Docker containers. Uh, what we do is we put a layer uh, able to capture uh, the interactions between the kernel and the, and the containers, or the applications running on top of that, uh, of that machine, and sort of see inside the containers from underneath, if you want. 
So this data is, uh, e every uh, of these interactions is collected uh, and uh, this data goes to the CSV container and then uh, it can be used, uh, exported to a centralized place for capture uh, and analysis and so on. Uh, the advantage of this is that uh, deploying monitoring instead of meaning putting something inside each of these components just means doing a Docker run sysdig or if you have an orchestrator like Docker Swarm, just making sure that uh, uh, there's one and only one of these CSD containers running on each machine and then you are done with the plumbing of the data. Let's take a look in practice. Uh, here I have uh, a little four node infrastructure running uh, Swarm on uh, AWS. So I can see the four nodes uh, here and uh, these are, you know, virtual machines. I can expand any of them and they can look at the containers uh, that are running inside the machine. And of course, uh, you know, I can pick, for example, the Cassandra container and uh, uh, take a look at the CPU of that container and I'm able essentially to see the data for that container. And this is useful, it's important, but it's still sort of black box, right? At the same time, with SysDig, I can type, for example, Cassandra uh, here, and uh, uh, I uh, uh, get uh, a bunch of uh, Cassandra-related uh, metrics, uh, and uh, um, I'm able to um, uh, see stuff like, uh, uh, for example, Cassandra overview. So here I have my nice dashboard for Cassandra and uh, I can see the write request, read request, latency, disk utilization, nectar bytes, heap, compactions, pending handoffs. So this is like rich data coming uh, from, from inside the application. How does this work? How is this data collected? So sysdig from this container detects that container two is Cassandra. It does that by detecting every container that, that starts and stops by looking essentially at the system activity and then is able to pattern match uh, what's running inside a specific container. Through this pattern matching, uh, we detect that uh, the, this is a Java application uh, and we know that, this, that Java exports these metrics through JMX, so we're able to go and flip uh, JMX export for this application uh, uh, on from the other container. Once the metrics are flowing, through port matching and command line matching, we detect that this is Cassandra and we start collecting the JMX beans uh, that are specific for, for, for Cassandra. We pipe everything to our backend and then you, you get essentially a visualization of what's running inside this container. All of this work just to get metrics for uh, uh, Cassandra inside the container. Why it's so important? It's so important because with containers, especially when they are orchestrated, you have this important step of composability. So uh, the fact of uh, the requirement of having to instrument your containers uh, for monitoring or for security or for anything else just doesn't work. So in terms of best practices for extracting the data, you should not need to modify your containers uh, or code for monitoring. There are ways to extract this information from outside the containers and you should preserve the cleanliness of the containers. There are many benefits with that. Uh, composability, uh, decreasing the attack surface, uh, being able to, to use images that are coming from the Docker Hub. In a general way, you should not be uh, involved in instrumenting for monitoring at all. So um, it's uh, uh, possible to get these metrics from outside and uh, you having to write scripts or run agents or anything else uh, to collect metrics is something that uh, just doesn't work anymore in a heavily orchestrated environment. And in a general way, the, your philosophy should be just producing custom metrics. Those are the ones that are coming from inside your application. Uh, those are the ones uh, that are part, uh, part of those, the business logic. You can use StatsD, you can use uh, other mechanisms for that. Those are the ones that the monitoring tool typically cannot get. Everything else should come from the monitoring tool and not for you, from you. And that's essentially the philosophy that we have at Sysdig. Now, okay, the data is flowing, it's collected, uh, and uh, you can see it. The problem is still uh, browsing uh, this kind of stuff at the physical level is sort of limited. Uh, again, you know, essentially what we have here in the user interface right now, it's very similar to this, right? A bunch of nodes with containers running, running on, top of, uh, on, on top of them. Ideally, what you want to see is the metrics for one specific service, right? So for the blue service. 
there are multiple containers that implement it. How do you get the data that allows you to work at that level? Because getting metrics on containers that come and go, sometimes only last for seconds and move from machine to machine, is not going to help you understand what's happening. While, uh, you know, services tend to be persistent, they tend to be the unit that you want to think about. So, uh, from that point of view, uh, what we can do is uh, go and regroup this infrastructure uh, as, uh, um, uh, uh, for example, we have Docker Swarm uh, um, uh, integration. What happens here is uh, the monitoring tool, in this case is Dig, uh, understands Swarm, understands the Swarm API, and pulls this API for uh, information about services that are running uh, topology, dependencies, and, and this kind of stuff. And then it's able to essentially represent the data in a way that is uh, service-oriented. So take a look at immediately how things, essentially the services running on this cluster start popping up. You know, we're, we see now that we have Cassandra, that we have uh, Java Client, Mongo Redis, WordPress, uh, and so on. So, for example, we can have a nice dashboard that uh, is showing me all of these different services and compares stuff like uh, request service time, uh, number of requests, CPU utilization, memory, network data, and all of this kind of stuff per service. So I can see how the service compare to each other. Again, the way this works is containers belonging to the single service, are th their metrics are brought together, are tagged automatically, and then the backend correlates them and puts these metrics together because it understands that these three containers are part of the part of the same service. Here, for example, if I go to, for example, WordPress, I have uh, um, a two container service here, and uh, I can type something like uh, HTTP, and now we are looking at uh, request count, uh, number of er errors, uh, the response time, uh, the um, top endpoints in terms of number of requests and the slowest endpoints in terms of uh, response time. All of these is, again, captured automatically and dynamically from underneath the containers. In this case, a lot of this data is uh, uh, created by observing the network traffic and the way containers talk to each other, decoding this data so that it's possible to see, for example, which specific requests are made and measure how long they take, and then correlating, aggregating this data for multiple containers into like a, a single service that then can be uh, observed uh, in, a, in a consistent way. This becomes even more uh, visible when uh, we look at topology. So one of the things that SysD can do by looking at the network data is um, looking at uh, um, uh, creating real-time topological representations of an infrastructure. So uh, here we're looking, for example, at, at the physical topology of this cluster. So what we were looking before, uh, what we were looking at before as a table, now it's a dependency map. This is created uh, essentially dynamically and updated every 10 seconds. And uh, I often compare this a bit to Google Maps for your infrastructure because I can go and I can, you know, zoom inside a single machine and I start seeing the Docker containers implementing this, this warm cluster. And then I can, you know, keep zoom, zooming and uh, even expand, you know, specific machines and see the processes that are running inside machine, in each machine and how the processes talk to each other. Problem is, it's sort of messy, right? It's a bit like this. Uh, if we take this exactly the same infrastructure and we regroup it uh, in a way that is uh, uh, service uh, uh, aware, so we do the same thing that uh, uh, we've been uh, doing before, so change the grouping and make this swarm aware, and what happens now is uh, the tool understands swarm services and not only us uh, and container. Now, you know, the diagram becomes much more clear. We can see essentially the Java cli client talking to the Java application, talking to Redis and Cassandra, and we can see, you know, WordPress service uh, with a client, uh, WordPress and MariaDB in the background. So, uh, this is typically the level that, uh, uh, especially people implementing the services want to uh, reason at instead of again, chasing the different containers as they move uh, around the infrastructure and being able to look at container IDs. Um, this is uh, 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 the end of my presentation. 
So I believe there's still a couple of minutes for questions. So happy to answer any question that uh, you guys might have. Yes? How does uh, short-lived containers get mapped? Yeah. Uh, so the map, sorry. Uh, the question is how uh, do short-lived containers uh, get represented in the map? So what the map does is uh, it uh, uh, aggregates the data and the relationship for a, uh, relationships for a specific amount of time uh, that you can uh, define. So uh, right now we're looking at one hour. We can decide to look at it. And for this hour, we collect every container. And even if the container is living only for like uh, 30 milliseconds, we still capture it because we capture every single little piece of activity that, that this container does. So. Uh, uh, here we're seeing every single container that has appeared even for, for a very short uh, uh, amount of time in the last hour. Of course, when it's at the logical level, you're sort of shielded a bit like that. So it's important to capture all of the data, but then you're seeing the service that stays and persists. At the same time, you can change the time interval and look, uh, I don't know what, what's going to happen, but probably the, this infrastructure is pretty static, so not a lot of difference, but you can see things at a shorter time to narrow down you know, just what's happening now in real time. Or you can also go back in time and pick a time range, and we preserve the topology in the past. So typical thing, you know, like my infrastructure uh, uh, had issues uh, last night at 1 AM. You can go and rewind the, the topology, and you can see what was the topology last night, last night at 1 AM. Yes? So we are working on that kind of functionality. Uh, it's currently only embedded in our open source tool. It's called Sysdic Tracers. And you use it essentially exactly for this, to mark requests uh, and, uh, and being able to essentially uh, add your own metadata to them and being able potentially to trace them across multiple machines. The tool, uh, the end-to-end -end monitoring tool, and especially these maps that I'm showing you now, don't have the, that feature yet. It's something that uh, we've, we've, we're working on. How long does the data persist uh, the monitoring? So the marketing answer is forever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what, we do is, what we do is we do roll-ups. So uh, essentially, uh, data comes at 10 second granularity for like uh, a day, and then it, it, it goes down to like uh, minute granularity, uh, and then it goes down to you know um, uh, hour granularity and then day granularity. So you can, in practice, go back and look at your data like uh, 50 months ago because we never throw it away. But what happens is gradually you lose a bit of of, of resolution in your data. One more question. So uh, the question is uh, if uh, security tools, uh, maybe like the twist lock uh, that you show that, that, that you saw in the previous session, are, go are going are going to block our container. Um, our instrumentation technology is, uh, uh, and, and it's exactly the same agent is used both by open source SD, which is uh, let's say a command line troubleshooting tool, open source, available on GitHub. We have millions of users uh, for the tool and for the commercial tool that I'm showing in this demo. So we tend to have a pretty broad uh, use uh, set of set of users, uh, pretty big deployment, and uh, uh, so this is something that you know is part of the ecosystem. It's been part of the ecosystem for quite a while now, and uh, uh, we've never had real issues about being blocked. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, as other containers, you know, maybe the static scanning techniques uh, highlight uh, something that uh, uh, is considered like a vulnerability, we fix it right away, and typically we, we've never had that concern. This was the last question. All right, thank you guys very much for your time and your attention. <laughs> Have a great afternoon. My name's David Fernandez. I'm with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. My name is Peyton McNally. I'm the CIO for Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology. And as David said, we swear we have slides, but we're going to do this one old school and just talk it out. So thanks. So Peyton, tell us about Hudson Alpha. 
Um, Hudson Alpha is a nonprofit research institute where we have 38 associate companies. These are like tenant companies, so we're kind of like an incubator, but set up before incubators were cool. And, uh, and then we have a few hundred researchers that are solely focused on life sciences, so genetics and genomics. And, uh, and then we also have an education component as well as a genomic medicine component where the, the founder's vision of Hudson Alpha is to translate all this research into clinical care that impacts a human life. And so that's our, that's our shtick, that's what we do. We're a nonprofit and um, focused on accelerating that care. And tell us what the business and our research challenges Hudson Alpha faced were. So a, a couple of years ago, Hudson Alpha was, uh, was one of the first 10 to, to buy into uh, a new sequencing platform called the HiSeq X, dun dun dun. And so the HiSeq X, what it actually did was it produced 20 times more data than we had ever previously done at Hudson Alpha. And so I don't know anybody's familiar with Huntsville, but we're not exactly the main thoroughfare of the internet. And so um, we had a lot of technical challenges uh, in onboarding this new platform, but then additionally there were there were real challenges with how do we make the best use of this data. And so um, if you listen to NPR or any of these uh, kind of TEDx talks or things like that, there's a real big issue with reproducibility of scientific research. And so it's, uh, it's rather interesting that in genomics there's a lot of really cool papers that get published that nobody else in another lab can actually do anything with. And so uh, we also, at the time all this research is happening, there was also an enterprise IT mission. And so we had to, um, to deploy apps, websites, uh, telemedicine, telehealth, EHRs, all the, the whole nines. And so it, it, it got to the point where we kind of had to have a fundamental change in how we deploy those services. And how do containers help translate the research into medical realities at Hudson Alpha? So this was the one, guys, where I'm not going to lie. I had a really cool picture. But um, so we, uh, we actually started early on with specific parts of the, the genomics pipeline. And, uh, and so a pipeline is kind of the, the full body of work that a researcher would spend perhaps even their entire career working on is how do I take this input, how do I quality assure that, that process, and how do I discern this knowledge uh, on, the, on the, the output side of this process, which may in turn be somebody else's start step for their pipeline. It's a pipeline just like anything else we do in tech. Um, so we started with, with really the, the basic elemental step of what's coming off of these machines, and we realized real quick, uh, this is really pre-implementation of Swarm, that there were a lot of steps as part of this that um, through our existing schedulers, we were able to, to really dig in and hand these tools and say, here, Mr. Postdoc, the biologist, create the Docker file. Tell us what you want to run. And so a lot of those steps, um, my team, myself, we weren't even really involved in, in how that got baked, but, but we were really looking to, um, to leverage our existing bare metal applications that, um, that were, we'd already invested in. I mentioned we're a nonprofit, so our goal was to, to gain as much use of that, but not um, isolate specific resources for a specific technology stack that may not play well with another one. And so, uh, we began to containerize things like the primary analysis step, the secondary analysis. These are very in awesome names for steps. But um, and one of the things early on that we uh, that we leveraged was uh, we, we were C7000, so HPE C7000, Blade Compute, typical HPC stack. Okay, we had a large elaborate SAN, we had a whole lot of Intel cores, and uh, and and really just scheduled those jobs. Um, and, and, and got to the point where there were, in the storage growth that we had, we had more challenges with maintaining our SAN than we did with the actual job itself. And so we looked at direct attached storage for a lot of this, and that's enter Synergy. So we, uh, we started in with Synergy about a year ago, uh, and that's uh, HP's new composable infrastructure. And the goal there is similar to how you would build your your container using a Docker file, we now build our bare metal instance and the rest of our stack 
similarly using the same tools. And so we were provisioning public cloud with Terraform, and so now we provision bare metal and our public cloud using those same tool sets. And, uh, and really now at this point, just like I mentioned earlier on, we were talking about here, Mr. Postdoc, build your Docker file, we're, we're now able to, uh, to engage with, with biologists at a Terraform layer of the process and say, okay, what type of network, what type of resources, what type of orchestration do you need? And, and kind of turn them loose to, uh, to work on their next killer app in biology. Peyton, can you describe what the future is going to look like for containers and hybrid IT at Hudson Alpha? So non-volatile memory over fabric, blockchains, and uh, we really want to do a lot more with, uh, with telemedicine. And so being able to, um, you know, Alabama is, is an interesting state, to say the very least. And uh, I think um, we have a, a, a really good opportunity in Alabama with the work that Hudson Alpha does with our other partners like UAB um, to really push a lot of, of progress into telehealth and telemedicine, especially when, when you take personalized medicine, the fact that you're no longer a bell curve, you are you, and your DNA tells you uh, and your physician what best path for you to be on. When you start to apply that in, in, in the telehealth context and, and start to orchestrate these jobs as containers and, uh, and have one test that's good for the rest of your life, it starts to get really interesting, especially when, uh, when individual um, researchers somewhere are able to to now transport that killer app out to GitHub and let you download it at your house and run your genome through it. It gets really interesting, and so I think we're uh, we're very excited about the future and um, and leveraging containers for that, as well as um, further orchestration of our our bare metal jobs. So you might have other questions that we can't put on the slideshow. All right, cool, well thank you.